Crime File, based on John Creasy's novel, Battle for Inspector West. Dramatized for radio by Mark Fellhauer. Battle for Inspector West, starring M.L. Elry. As Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard. And Sean Windsor. As his wife, Janet. Part one. Honeymoon spells nightmare. You answer the rocket. Get your truck out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You might be qualified in them. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay. You want to go right now? Hey, kids. It's your COVID pal, ML Elric, coming to you from a place that is so 2020. Of course, I'm coming to you from my bedroom because I tested positive for COVID. And Sean Windsor, who also tested positive for COVID, will not be with us today as he recovers in one of the many uh, luxurious and comfortable outbuildings in his Ann Arbor estate. But he may be watching us which would be great because it's the most attention he's paid to this show in three years. So, Sean, we wish you Godspeed in your recovery. And uh, and ironically, uh, our uh, intro, uh, so elegantly produced by Mr. Fellhauer, uh, talks about honeymoon. And our subject today is about a powerful Michigan lawmaker who ruined a relative's honeymoon by insisting on a sexual favor from the bride just before the uh before they became uh man man and, wife and wife and they pro, pr- pronoun problem here is uh the uh the creepy politician's brother was the groom and his soon to be sister-in-law was the bride to work through some of this we're joined by david zeman editor of bridge magazine <coughs> excuse me which COVID. broke this story and uh has tons of exclusive comment and who also was the editor for Jim Schaefer and I at the Detroit Free Press when we broke the Kwame Kilpatrick scandal. So, David, thanks for making the time to join us this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Michael. So one of the reasons why we're talking about this and, and bringing it in the Kilpatrick context is because listener Nick inspired our conversation with this email. He said, Mike, a little overly familiar there, Nick, uh, do you prefer... <laughs> that the pair of bridge reporters or predict that the pair of bridge reporters joins your club and wins a Pulitzer for that Chatfield bombshell. A line of that jumped out at me as it relates to your own dogged pursuit of public corruption was the married evangelical boy scout living in the Northern Michigan boonies like to party hard and run around on his missus at Dan Gilbert's new downtown Detroit hotel. All while Dan was lobbying for auto insurance reform development incentives and other so-called Gilbert bills. Nick then quotes from the exclusive bridge reporting Lee Chatfield would request rides at all times of the night, Aaron recalled. They made regular trips to meet up with women in ritzy Birmingham, frequented the Legends Strip Club in Detroit, and would stay at expensive places like Detroit's Shinola Hotels. Uh, In a nutshell, there are a lot of similarities and quite a few significant differences between the Kilpatrick and Chatfield scandals. But, um, But I thought we'd have David on to talk a little bit about, first of all, how Bridge broke this big story, and then we can dive into some of the things that have us uh, hearkening back to the Kilpatrick days and some of the very uh, significant differences between these two cases. So, David, take it away. Well, let, let's start with the, with, with the small matter of uh, we, we uh, changed our name to Bridge Michigan uh, about a, a year or two ago from Bridge Magazine. Uh, which makes sense since we, uh, since no one knew, uh, you know, where the hell Bridge uh, Bridge Magazine was, so we're now officially Bridge Magazine. But um, Michigan, uh, Michigan, yeah, I said Bridge <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> BridgeMI.com is the website. BridgeMI.com, yes, and that's where you can find our uh, story from uh, last uh, Friday night, uh, written by Kelly House and Jonathan Osting. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, this story came to us uh, just before uh, the holidays, Mike, um, when um, uh, Rebecca Chatfield, the the uh, woman at the center of this, uh, actually uh, called us, called me, um, uh, to 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 let us know that she had filed a, a, a police report uh, with uh, with the Lansing Police Department 
uh, and had notified her her husband and some family members uh, of what she said happened to her over more than a decade's time at, at, at uh, the hands of her now brother-in-law, Lee Chatfield, the former uh, Speaker of the House. And um, she told me uh, her story um, uh, and told me that she was reaching out to us uh, at Bridge uh, for a couple of, uh, of reasons. Um, uh, first, because she knew that the uh, what she had said she had told the Lansing police, uh, once that became public, it would become politically explosive. And she feared that if she stayed silent and didn't say anything, um, that uh, Lee Chatfield, with his access to media and his visibility, uh, would be able to control the narrative about what did or did not happen. Uh, and that she would be voiceless. And she wanted to have an avenue that uh, through which uh, her story and her voice could be could be told uh, directly so that she wasn't a passive uh, bystander and 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 the other side, as she sees it, would be allowed to control the narrative uh, of what happened. And secondly, um, she said that she wanted to come forward because, as the story makes clear, she felt like she really had no place to turn. Uh, particularly when she was, you know, 15, 16 years old when she said this started. Um, and she felt like she had no options to get out of it. And so she she said she really wanted to be an inspiration to other young people, particularly young girls um, who, um, who might feel like they're trapped uh, in a relationship that, that, uh, that they have not consented to and would hopefully give them some inspiration to speak up, to find somebody to report it to, so that uh, what happened to her would not happen to them. So one of the things um, that, uh, that we really miss about Bridge Magazine, of course, is the explicit letters section. But, uh, but Bridge Michigan is, uh, is a, a 10 years now. They've been breaking big stories and doing a lot of policy work in Michigan. Um, you can subscribe to it. You can also read these stories for free at bridgemichigan.com, which I encourage you to do, and we'll include a link on our website. But as you tell us how this story evolved, I guess one difference I wasn't aware of between the Kilpatrick and Chatfield stories is Jim and I, I think, told you about the text messages, and you said, holy crap. I imagine when you told uh, your reporters, hey, I got a call from the former Speaker of the House uh, sister-in-law who says that she was sexually abused, they must have said, holy something or other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, the, the first thing I did was I, 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 I talked to my co-editor, Joel Kurth, and, and to our CEO, John Bebo, and and we sort of had a threshold issue of, is this the kind of story that uh, that is really in, in, in Bridge, Michigan's uh, wheelhouse? I mean, we, we, we tend to cover the sort of vegetables of the of the news hmm. ecosystem right you know policy education health uh, business that sort of thing um and we certainly are not in the business of covering uh, infidelities of, of, of political folks um uh, i don't think a lot of a lot of mainstream media uh, organizations are, are really in the business of doing that anymore although you know um there are certain big exceptions w what attracted us to this story was not um, what um, this woman's brother told us about her, about you know wheeling her his his brother around to hookups with women all over Lansing and Detroit. Um, what what we see this story as being about is about um, uh, uh, the possibility of someone wielding power to uh, to to um, uh, to perform a criminal act uh, on somebody who was powerless to stop it. If in fact. Uh, this this uh, this uh, woman was was underage at the time, and if in fact, as she says, Lee was her teacher at the time that this started, uh, those are two different avenues through which, if true, criminal charges uh, could be pursued. And so, uh, you know, the, the, you know, taking advantage of someone who is vulnerable either because they're a a, a, a kid from a troubled family. Um, at a uh, private school in northern Michigan um, or, you know, taking advantage of, of them. Perhaps, you know, uh, there's a mention in our story that he um, uh, may have uh, been having affairs with people on his staff. 
Uh, right. Those are two avenues through which uh, we thought, um, uh, if true, you know, that sort of abuse of power uh, was something that was worth uh, telling people about. Have you heard of stories like that? I mean, uh, maybe not enough to print, but I, are the rumors strong enough? Because usually when this happens, when somebody comes forward and it happened to other people, they come forward as well. It strength in numbers. Yeah, well, you know, one of the difficulties um, of this story and why we waited so long uh, to publish it is because, it, um, you know, we we were prosecuting her story, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, Kelly and Jonathan sat, sat down with her over Zoom over many, many hours. And, you know, one of the difficulties here was that uh, she hadn't told anybody at the time, right? Uh, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, the way in which these older uh, cases are investigated uh, are by, you know, asking the, the person who said that they were abused, well, did you tell anyone contemporaneously? Did you uh, keep a diary? Did you have a notebook and so forth? Um, and uh, in many of the high profile cases that we've seen, they have. And that was really compelling. But there are also many cases in which in which uh, someone in this position tell, tells nobody and doesn't do it for so many years. And I think we saw a lot of that in the in the Nasser case. And and, it, you know, it took one or a couple of people to, to come forward um, to give other people the the courage and, and support they felt they needed before before they could come forward as well. So, um, you know, it was it, it was it, it was. Uh, uh, a long road to, to getting there and and uh, you know we're still seeking the police report to to uh further corroborate this story can she provide you a copy of the police report uh uh well we we you know that that's certainly something that 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 uh we're pursuing and um no we do we, we did we're not able to get the police report um the uh, police department uh, uh rejected our freedom of information act request saying that it was a, a a case that they were actively uh investigating and uh up until the time that she obtained legal counsel um she was not able to get it from them uh, as well but uh presumably sure. With legal counsel, that, that they will get that in pretty short order. And, and let's be clear, there's no question that there is a police report. Lansing police have acknowledged they're investigating this. Michigan State police have acknowledged they're investigating this. Correct. So this is a genuine record. And when I think about the Kilpatrick case and the Chatfield case, both of them uh, called into question the uh, credibility of the subject. Um, in Kilpatrick's case, he, he claimed to be a family man who didn't have wild parties and would never cheat on his wife, his children, his family, or his God. Uh, Lee Chatfield, uh, I'm going to say this, it may sound pejorative, but is a holy roller from northern Michigan who talks about family and faith and the kind of things. I mean, he's, he's broken a couple of the commandments, as I can tell, from the, uh, from the reporting so far. But in both cases, one similarity was when when Jim and I brought this stuff to the free press, we originally focused on the mayor is a liar and he doesn't tell the truth on the witness stand. He doesn't tell the truth in public. He's someone who can't be trusted because we thought trust in public officials was very important. But the editors at the free press very quickly said, let's look at the illegality. And David, being a lawyer, was really helpful with that. And so when we reported the Kilpatrick case, we focused mainly on the perjury, which was a felony and involved lying under oath about an affair. And people forget this, lying under oath about whether he conspired with his chief of staff and mistress to ruin the careers of police officers who were just doing their job. In this case, certainly you have some questions about the moral high ground, the authenticity, the credibility of a man who was probably the second most powerful person in the state of Michigan for two years. But you also have a criminal act and you have a public record, a police report, which now, to my mind, leaves you with very little uh, flexibility as to whether or not you can report this, because it is a matter of public record. A crime has been alleged by someone who is a public figure and still aspires to be an influential and powerful public figure. But the one difference is we had the text messages for a long time and spent a lot of time authenticating them before we published I know that you spent some time authenticating these before these allegations before you could publish. 
but I'm wondering if if you felt like uh, Bridge had to act, act a little faster than it would have otherwise because another outlet had reported, hey, there's a police report saying Lee Chatfield's a creep. Well, the, the police, yeah, I mean, the, uh, a, a, a local Lansing publication, um, Lansing City Pulse, uh, uh, published uh, the fact that there was a police uh, investigation into uh, Lee Chatfield, um, and her newly retained lawyer said that it dealt with um, allegations of sexual uh, assault. So, I mean, that's, you know, obviously one of the questions that, that we had, you know, I mean, we were, uh, we were, you know, we knew about that complaint a couple of weeks earlier, right before the holidays, um, but we wanted to get as much information as we as we could before before we published. And one of the questions we had to ask ourselves is, or one of the things we had to check ourselves on, I should say, is is we didn't want to be rushed before we felt comfortable with this, regardless of how many other publications. Um, uh, knew about the, the, the basic charge. We, we we knew the details of it, and we knew it straight from the woman who uh, uh, who had uh, lodged the allegations. Um, but we wanted to make sure we had uh, done everything we can uh, to um, uh, to make sure that her story was consistent as many times as we talked to her, to make sure that there weren't any red flags, to make sure that there weren't any. Uh, inconsistencies uh, in what she told us uh, uh, and and what we were able to find on the public record. And to that extent, there was some um, peripheral corroboration, not only from her husband, of, of course, um, who went into uh, some detail about um, how his wife uh, had, had changed, his then girlfriend and then wife had changed, and how she conducted herself and how it all made sense right now. Um, but uh, just from uh, the actions that she saw, that he saw from his older brother, who he had worshipped, um, uh, both as a teenager um, and and also as his essentially his driver uh, in in Lansing to see, you know, um, from his view, what kind of moral boundaries or lack of moral boundaries uh, Lee Chatfield had uh, with regard to his treatment of, of women. Um, and then there are other smaller details we were able to corroborate. For instance, uh, Rebecca told us this this past July, uh, Lee, Lee was, you know, uh, uh, Rebecca and her husband Aaron uh, moved to Lansing a couple of years ago. And uh, and Lee was racing over there um, to be with her while before her husband could come home. And she told us, uh, you know, the night that it happened, and that uh, then she got a call or text from Lee saying, oh, I can't make it. I got into an, a traffic accident. And then, you know, obviously we we're able to check that as well and get the police report on this traffic accident as well. So, you know, it, it was a matter of trying to hunt down any any sort of a kernel of any of her uh, account uh, to see if it can be verified, as well as make every effort that we could to get a hold of Lee Chatfield and his family, which as the story makes clear, we went to extraordinary efforts to try to reach uh, many members of the family. Did uh, Lee Chatfield just ghost you or was it an official reply? I mean, because he probably, I would assume, was shocked that other people knew about this. Uh, did you get any kind of reply from him? Um, no, no. In fact, he, he you know, uh, his longtime uh, cell phone that he had used uh, was, was disconnected. He had his own website that went down. Uh, he went, uh, you know, once it once it became known to his family that we were looking into this and that we had talked to Rebecca over the holidays, um, um, those sort of things started to happen. Now, we got secondhand um, reports from other brother, another brother about, you know, Lee did not want to talk. Um, and uh, we, then we also had his father. Um, tell us very briefly that he was that his son was uh, uh, innocent of all these allegations, and but he didn't want to talk any further on that. Um, what you know, one thing that 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 did help in in sort of getting his his position out was um, the afternoon hours before we reported the story, his own lawyer uh, uh, went to social media and put out a statement. Mm -hmm. Uh, saying that, yes, they did have a relationship, but it was consensual and only happened when both of them were um, were adults. Um, and um, also uh, said in the statement that Lee had had affairs with other people as well, um, which, 
you know, uh, preceded what uh, his brother, his brother Aaron, Rebecca's husband, had told us about Lee's actions when he was in Lansing. Yeah, of that was certainly a major difference between the Kilpatrick story and Chatfield. Kilpatrick maintained that he hadn't cheated on anybody and then eventually had to cop to it. Whereas Chatfield said, uh, yeah, I had sex with her. And guess what? I had sex with a bunch of other people, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what was going on, on there, but, you know, it was he I, uh, uh, presumably, you know, I, I think there's a there's a. Uh, dynamic where politicians sometimes feel like if they get ahead and say it first, that that maybe that, you know, takes away a little bit of the uh, sting from a, a newspaper story. Um, the story is really good, because like you said, uh, not only Rebecca, a firsthand account, but um, husband Aaron, Lee's brother. Uh, there's some other people, too, that went to the school uh, that felt there was always something a little off. Uh, how many people were that that uh, did your reporters find like that that added yeah, there was always something weird, you know, added a little bit of the color to the story. You mean about Lee? About Lee, yeah, and what was happening at the school. Because, you know, as you said, his lawyer came out and said, look, it was consensual, happened after she's 18, because he's just solely looking at what is illegal as opposed to, I mean, it's not a good thing to do what he did in the Christian world and what their family's enterprise is. Um, but I was just curious as to, did other people seem to know or have a feeling about this when she was younger? Yeah, well, I mean, the the, the story uh, only quotes Rebecca, Rebecca's mother, um, and um, uh, and also Aaron, and, and as well as another brother, uh, Paul, uh, who also uh, said that, um, who, who somewhat defends uh, Lee in saying that um, uh, he doesn't think uh, it went back as far as Rebecca says it went back, but also... Um, uh, recognizes that Lee did inappropriate things with her. So uh, he didn't have any firsthand knowledge. This was more his uh, speculation, but <clears throat> there wasn't a lot of uh, pushback on, on the part of uh, his family about, uh, you know, Lee's uh, uh, having some sort of relationship uh, with his younger brother's girlfriend. So, David, I know you uh, being still an employed journalist as an unemployed journalist. I don't really worry about deadlines. I think you have one coming. Can, can you stay for a minute? Or do you need to get to your next uh, meeting? I have a few more minutes. OK, great. Um, so before you go, I'd love to get your take and we can dive into this a little after you're gone too, um, on what similarities and differences you see between the Chatfield situation. And the Kilpatrick situation. It, it seems like it, like it's a different time, um, um, but uh, you know, in 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 uh, you know, I, it, it's hard for it's hard for me to say. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, legal digging on both sides, both uh, in the uh, the lawyers who are representing the lawyer who is representing Lee Chatfield in the law firm that is rep representing uh, Rebecca. Uh, probably going into uh, trying to find old uh, text messages and and uh, and other communications between the the the, uh, the two of them um, uh, to support each of each of their sides. Um, so um, th that 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 to me is uh, is one thing that just stands out um, uh, in terms of you know just so much of their lives being uh, taking place over over, you know, electronically, uh, over text messages, presumably, and uh, Snapchat and that sort of thing. So um, I, I think, um, uh, you know, there's been no criminal charges filed yet. There's been no civil suit filed yet. Um, and um, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And, and I don't think anyone has a meaningful conclusion as to what did happen. But I think, uh, you know, it's going to be a longer uh, uh, legal game on both sides to try to um, find some of the, these uh, recordings that might, uh, um, you know, give more insight into in, into what happened. So he he Lee Chatfield was term limited out and then took over. Um, I forget what I forget what economic thing he took over, which he had to resign from because the yeah, members Southwest did. Southwest Michigan. There you go. Yeah, and the members weren't too happy with with whatever. What is he doing now, and how does this affect what he's doing now? Uh, 
Yeah, well, you know, I mean, w- one of the interesting things and 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 something that um, Rebecca's lawyer says that he's, he's going to pursue uh, is how much money he was able to collect as Speaker of the House um, through these, uh, you know, uh, uh, these uh, dark money, this dark money organization. He had three or four uh, political uh, uh, packs um, in which, you know, he was able to, to garner a lot of money and 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 uh, and distribute support to different candidates and and so forth. And um, uh, just from what Aaron told us, and we only published a small part of what Aaron told us about how he was paid um, and about how Lee was uh, spending money on different uh, travel and entertainment expenses and so forth. So uh, those are. Wow. Those are all areas that are, are ripe for uh, revelation, and, and uh, I think a, a lot of news publications are digging into them now. Well, I think it's, it's interesting when you look at the two cases. Kilpatrick was, of course, in office, and Chatfield is out of office, but you see some similarities in terms of an arrogance, an abuse of power, uh, profligate spending of campaign money and, and nonprofit money. Uh, putting relatives and friends on the on the on the payroll, um, yeah. and 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 just some simple things like having sex in Detroit hotels and in in office. Now Chatfield um, declines or denies, I believe, that he had sex in the speaker's office. Or maybe he hasn't spoken specifically to that. I should let everybody know that we did reach out to his lawyer this morning and offer her an opportunity to come on the show. She's tied up today, um, but may come on on a future show. But but there there seems to be a similarity here in this uh, the sense of entitlement that I'm a powerful person. I can have whoever I want. I can have whatever I want. I'll get money from people to live this lavish lifestyle. And uh, and at the end of the day, um, it, it seems that that this is something that uh, I, I think David does speak to a passage of time. It's been almost 15 years since the Kilpatrick scandal broke. And I think as often happens in public life, we become kind of inured to these things because every time some creep does something like this, we become a little less shocked. And one of the things that I think really makes the Chatfield thing uh, stand out to me, whether or not he's guilty of what his sister-in-law has accused him of, is just the stunning an appalling hypocrisy of someone who wraps himself in his faith, someone who claims to be family oriented and values oriented and preaches that to other people who seems to have no appreciation whatsoever for walking the talk that they talk so much. <coughs> oh, there's that COVID. <coughs> I didn't even know you had COVID, Mike. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we're, and, we're and, not going to have lunch now. Yeah. <laughs> you, men- you mentioned that in the political sphere, but, you know, remember that, uh, uh, you know, when you read her story, this all happened in the sphere of this uh, this church and uh, and private Christian school uh, that um, Rusty Chatfield, uh, Lee's father, uh, uh, runs up near Burt Lake in, in, in northern Michigan, and um, you know there were uh, the uh, Rebecca and her mom talk quite a bit about the sort of uh, you know the the, the, the uh, patriarchal sort of way in which this was run, the way you know that that uh, that uh, it, it had very strong male figures and and not terribly strong uh, um, support for uh, for young women. So you know I you know obviously this is. Uh, one family's account, and um, um, you know we 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 need to learn more. But um, you know, it's actually sort of. I just want to point out this two spheres of of power: one within this sort of church Christian school setting, and then a separate, and maybe analogous one in in the corridors of power in Lansing. Yeah, and and the one thing that's not up for debate is he's a scumbag and a shitty brother. Because uh, it's not written in any book that I've seen, but I think it's all kind of well known that you don't bang your brother's wife. That's frowned upon in every faith and in every corner of the world that I'm aware of. I'm not going to weigh in on that on that uh, area, but um, <laughs> but but I I, I I appreciate your your uh, passion. 
One one other question about the timeline because you know he's saying hey this this ended in July of uh, last year obviously started when she was eighteen this is all all kind of legalese type stuff why did she come forward now because I saw someone say oh did he end the affair and she wanted to keep it going is that why she's doing this sure sure um, you know that that again goes back to to the 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 church thing and that's and that's the reason why she wanted her voice. Uh, out here a, as well. I mean, I, I, she she felt, and, and and if you read the story, she she, she talks at several stages about how um, she felt like that was her whole world. When this started happening, um, she came from a family where her parents were just getting divorced, and her father was an alcoholic, and the Chatfield family was her really her only stability there. Um, uh, they provided a home. I'm talking about Lee Chatfield and his wife and their young kids. It was a place where she could go and babysit their young their young kids. It was a place where she could spend the night after a soccer game. Lee was also, you know, a soccer coach there, uh, as well as a teacher. Um, and um, and you know, her boyfriend was was Aaron. And and so it was a it was a place of stability and comfort when her own family life was sort of falling apart. And, and her father, who she was uh, living with, uh, had his own uh, alcohol problems and was also lived about an hour away. So it also made it uh, very convenient um, for her to spend a lot of time uh, at the Chatfields. And so, um, you know, I think it's, you know, it, 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 it's hard unless you're in her shoes, I suppose, sure. um, to, you know, with your 15 year old girl and something like this happens with improper touchings, as she alleges, um, uh, it's hard to know what to do. I mean, she said to us, if I told on him, where would I go? Yeah. You know, yeah. and and she says she was repeatedly told that um, uh, that uh, she wouldn't be believed and 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 you know that the Chatfields are the one constant in her life and they controlled the church they controlled the school they controlled their lives and um, and even when they moved to Lansing uh, there was you know still some control in the sense that um, her husband made his money yeah. through political organizations you know that were connected to to Lee so, you know, he was a glorified driver in his view. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, it, 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 and what she said to us was she couldn't live with it anymore. You know, it went on for so many years and she felt like she couldn't get out. But uh, the, the um, disconnect uh, but, and the lying to her own husband and her own family was something she just couldn't live with anymore. And she started going to therapy and she grew very depressed and she just felt like she needed to be released from this tangle that she'd been in for a decade. Well, as, as often as we see it, there just is no playbook for it. You know, you just don't know how a person's going to react. And when I, I think it's great that she went to the police first and then something like bridge. Cause so often you see somebody throw something out on Twitter or Facebook about a, a famous person or a political person. And I, it just, it helps credibility. I mean, her story is amazing. Bridge MI.com. If anybody wants well, look, to, I mean, you know, we, we make our brand on being a, sort of by the book, um, nonpartisan mm -hmm. news site. And there's, and I think there is something smart in going to a place that is, is not, uh, a place that, you know, uh, does sensationalistic type reporting. Um, and that, you know, if we put our people on it, we put our two finest reporters on it, uh, that it's going to be done right. And it's going to, and, and it's going to be a measured account. Uh, and it's not going to be filled with uh, gratuitous information. So um, we're glad she came to us. Well, David, thanks for joining us. Uh, BridgeMI.com, you can see that story, sev several other stories uh, about the Chatfield scandals that unfolds. And, of course, there's lots of good information there about COVID, about education and how things are happening in Michigan. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe. You should donate as well. Support has been 10 years, and clearly, Bridge Michigan is making an impact because this is a story that any reporter in this state would have loved to have gotten that phone call and went to Bridge Michigan. So congratulations, David. Keep up the uh, sober reporting. 
And when you're ready not to be so sober, give me a call. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, guys. It's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of people picked up that story naturally as they would, uh, but nobody has the details because they have the interview that Bridge had. Yeah, and, and let me break down the timeline, and I hope I have this right. Bridge had this information and had been working on this for quite a while. Clearly, they had the time to go get that police report from Lansing. And if you know anything about how Freedom of Information Act works, uh, police don't always fork those over right away. Uh, sometimes they do. Most of the time, they don't. And when word got out that there was a police report, I believe that was on Thursday from Lansing City Pulse. Mm -hmm. I think it was the next day that Bridge posted their story. So... My suspicion is they had to publish a little sooner than they would have liked to because this got out in the public domain. But the story they posted, I don't know how it could have been much better, even if they'd worked on it for another month. Um, it's some pretty solid reporting. Uh, there's enough detail in there that you have an idea what happened, but it's not gratuitous. And it's, um, you know, it's... Uh, you know, I, I remember when Republicans used to talk a lot about the moral high ground, and now we got uh, Todd Todd Corser and City Gamrat having affairs. You know, very conservative, holy roller Republicans. We got the former Speaker was doing this while he was Speaker. You know, I, I, I'm not here to tell people how to live their lives, but I think when people who think it's really important to tell us how to live their lives act in the exact opposite way, maybe it's time for them to shut the hell up. And on that note, uh, time for a sponsor because I don't even know—I don't even know how else to segue. It. It's it, just go to bridgemi.com and read about it. It's really good. Um, but it is a new year, and mortgage rates are likely to increase soon. So you got to act now. This is your chance to refinance and lock in a low rate. And the only place to do that—come on, we all know where that is. It's Hall Financial. Call Hall First dot com eight six six Call Hall. You can chat with them on the phone or online at Hall Financial. Their number one priority is client service with over 4,000 five-star reviews. Why else would you go? Where, where else would you go? I mean, that's the only place to go, right? I, I went there twice. I'm not looking to go anyplace else. No. I, I highly recommend them. They can close your loan in eight business days or less. They're the fastest in the industry. Uh, and make sure when you call them, ask for Dan Morrison and tell him ML sent you. Hey, uh, so how do you like being stuck in that room and being at home? Uh, as you can tell, it's inspired my David Lynch esque hairdo. <laughs> it does look, um, <laughs> yeah. it does look very David Lynch esque. It's, it's kind of kind of a eraser head uh, on the east side. Um, you know, this is this is funny, not funny. But when we were coming back from the Peach Bowl, bowl, I noticed on New Year's morning I had um, a sore throat, and so on the drive back, I wore a mask the whole time. Um, I was very careful around everybody. The, the next day, I got a rapid test. It came back negative. How, how long did and you? How long did you have to wait for that antigen test, the rapid test? Because tests are nowhere to be found. They're just really hard to find, unless you know Trudy. So, so let me tell you about my my daughter's a uh, student teacher, and so before she went to the classroom, we wanted to make sure she hadn't been exposed to anybody who had COVID. So on the Sunday, how responsible of her? What can I tell you? That's great. She runs in the family. So. <laughs> So I had to get this test on the Sunday after New Year's. So it would have been, I don't know, like the second? The third, I think. The third. Okay. Everywhere I went, no tests, no walk-ins, no schedules, uh, pharmacies, no tests. And I finally found a place in Warren that was doing walk-ins. And I had to wait in the cold for an hour and a half oh, just God. to get in the vestibule to wait for another hour to fill out the at the form to get scheduled for the test. And then I had to wait about an hour to get the test. And then in 15 minutes or so, it came back that I was negative. Now, my sore throat had kind of gone away. And even after being out in the cold, and I mean bitter cold yeah. for an hour and a half, I didn't feel that bad. Woke up Monday, felt better than I did on Sunday. We did the show on Tuesday, no problems. Uh, went up to East Lansing for the basketball game on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, a friend who had been on the trip said, you know, I had a sore throat. Now I've tested positive. I got tested at Spartan Stadium. It's quick and easy. You should get tested. I said, OK, I'm in town. I got nothing better to do. I went and got tested. It came back on Friday as positive. I have not felt bad at all. I feel a little 
tired, but I think it's mainly because when you lay in yep. bed yeah. for four days, you just kind of be, be, become a, a schlub. But Sean, it turns out, had been feeling badly um, and got tested and tested positive. And at some point, uh, he told us about that. And um, <laughs> and he's still not feeling good. No, he's so, not uh, doing well at all. So we hope that he's feeling better. You know, it's, um, you know, it's interesting because even when he's feeling great, he seems to be feeling pretty bad. <laughs> How do you know when Sean's feeling good? It's hard to tell. Yeah, I guess he just, he just goes, Oh, you know, I'm happy. That's all he ever well, said. No, I'm fine. Yeah. He said his test results were positive for COVID and negative for life. <laughs> it's really, I didn't know they, they that must be another swab they put somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the whole testing thing is just maddening uh, from a federal level where they promise that there's going to be plenty of them when there's no deal signed. Um, and now that's starting to get straightened out probably way too late. Cause that's, I think when this happens um, and when you guys both told me, you know, you were positive, it's like, okay, I got to get a test impossible to find and then next thing you know you started reading about different tests and maybe maybe this is just me doing too much of a deep dive and it's like no the antigen test shows when you are contagious and the pcr shows that it's in your system and they're, they're so sensitive it could have been a long time ago so you probably when you were in here you weren't contagious but it was still in your system because you had just tested negative so is the antigen the rapid test That's the rapid one yeah okay so, yeah, I don't know. And I, I know there's some people out there saying, well, this is why I shouldn't be vaccinated. This is why it doesn't matter if I get boosted, because this guy did it and he's been preaching about it for two years and he still got sick. Let me let me underscore that I don't feel bad. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why is because I was vaccinated and I was boosted. But it's also worth noting that I was wearing a mask a lot of the time. And so if you've been getting by with the cloth masks, and mine are usually double layered, Ooh. which has been recommended for a while, but uh, as are our Soul of Detroit masks, but it's probably time to switch to the N95 if you can get them yeah. or the KN95s, because it seems like this, this Omicron Every variant is smaller and, and more um, pernicious. Everyone's going to get it. Even if it's not as vicious. But the people who are getting really sick tend to be the people who haven't been vaccinated or boosted. Well, I'm glad you're doing well. I hope uh, I hope Sean starts feeling better too. Miss the big guy. Yeah this this is my fifth or sixth day in isolation, so I can get out and about uh, tomorrow, and I'm going to schedule a test. The other thing is, uh, my wife and another one of my daughters. Well, actually, my wife and both my daughters went and got tests. My oldest, the teacher. Her test came back negative. And even though my wife and my youngest daughter got tested on Sunday, they're still waiting to get their results back. So the it's system is really disaster. starting to bog down. It's a total disaster. You know what's not a disaster? Uh, financial planning. That's it, the best way to avoid a disaster. Exactly. Overreaction is not the strategy. You want to be a long-term investor. So when you see the market doing crazy things, don't worry about it. Just give all your money to Luke Nowacki at Pinnacle Wealth. He'll know what to do with it. 248-663-4748. He provides rational financial advice. If you should be in equities, should you be in bonds, uh, 401ks, what, what, how do I allocate that, 529? I don't know what any of these numbers mean. Just get advice, get a strategy. Call Luke Nowacki at Pinnacle Wealth, 248-663-4748. Because when you do, Luke will make it all about you, sweetheart. I can't, I can't find the Luke song. I don't know what I did with it. That was a big error. I'm, I'm just going to read it then. Securities Investment oh, yeah. Advisory Services offered through Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated. Member FINRA SIPC. Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated is separately owned <laughs> or other entities and or marketing names. Products, services referenced here are independent of Royal Alliance Associates, Inc. Oh, man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Did I do that? What a dork. Is him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek? I have a bonus geek of the week after yours, or do you want me to go first? I don't know. It's going to be tough to top mine, but if, if you if you think you you can, I'll let you go second. If not, let's uh, just prime the pump. No, I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. Okay. I, I, did you see this guy in Canada? He's a politician, so you know 
take that for what it's worth. And he tweeted out a picture of his wife, uh, something to the effect of she worked in the uh, ER or worked at her hospital shift for 12 hours, came home and look at her energy. She's shoveling the snow. And immediately Twitter's like, why didn't you go shovel it? What are you doing? And then they looked at his past tweets and I think he was watching a tennis match or some sports game. And the whole point being, why didn't you help out your wife if you care about her and love her so much for, um, you know, she works 12 hours and then comes home and shovels the drive when you had been home that whole time. And he just got raked on, uh, on Twitter about it. I don't know. It made me laugh because what an asshole. Just go, just go help out your wife. That's it. Oh yeah. What a, what a bum. I mean, even when I feel really lousy, I try and go scrape the snow off the cars for trees and the sure. girls. Here's a guy whose wife has been working 12 hours in probably one of the most dangerous situations in Canada. And, uh, and he makes a shovel of snow. Yeah, and below freezing temperatures. And here, here's what he tweeted with the photo. Even after a 12-hour night shift at the hospital, my wife still has the energy to shovel the driveway. God bless her and all our frontliners. Time to make her some breakfast. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. So I, she's uh, she's not I, just a good wife. In Canada, they would call that an A+. Plus. <laughs> okay. So beat, beat that uh, with your Geek of the Week. Oh, boy. Well, you, you go from the... Uh, the, the frigid air of Canada to some hot air here in the U S with Steph Maddow. The, uh, you may have seen her on 90 day fiance. If you have, that just means you're really using your time poorly, but she was rushed to the hospital after a fart attack. And you heard me right. She began and she's pretty nice looking. Yeah, yeah. So some adult website reached out and said, you should sell your flatulence. So instead of saying beat it creeps, she started jarring up her blasts at a thousand dollars a crack. She made two hundred thousand dollars before having to uh, take a pause. And um, turns out this high fiber diet that she was on that allowed her pr to produce fifty samples a week <laughs> had created such uh, such a heavy impact on her body. Let's say that this self-styled fartpreneur had extreme gas pains that she mistook, mistook for a heart attack. So the Daily Mirror reports that the way she was able to fuel this endeavor was by living off of mostly beans and eggs and later adding protein shakes. Ugh. And here's, here's the real disgusting part. It's not just because it allowed her to produce more flatulence, but because it made her smart, her farts smell worse well, maybe that's what, that's a good entrepreneur, though. That's uh, maybe that's what the people wanted. Well, someone who believes in in renewable energy and things like that. <laughs> I I just don't. I, I guess I have to compliment her. But uh, if I recall correctly from my visit at the Paris Peace Accords, methane is not one of the gases that is in short supply. <laughs> so uh, so while I appreciate the effort to be self sufficient, Steph Maddow, you. Our Geek of the Week. Well, we come to Sean's favorite part of the show, <laughs> and since he's with us in spirit, if not in body, we wanted to pick a song from one of his favorite bands, The Smiths, <laughs> that will both describe his condition, but also, we hope, inspire him to come back soon and tell us everything that's wrong with the show. So here is Morrissey and the Boys with Still Ill. 